It's a tough time in the United States right now. It's a tough time for a lot of people because the people who perceive that they're fighting against decades of injustice feel that they really have to stand up and be heard. And of course, there are some amongst them who are feeling poor and angry, who will be violent. But the vast majority are just simply saying, we've had injustice and it is associated with killing. But they also point out that in Kansas, black people are seven times more likely to die of COVID than white people. In other states, including even Washington, D.C., black people have three times the COVID death rate of white people. And of all the millions of people that are unemployed in the U.S. as a result of COVID con containment, the vast majority of them are black, Hispanic, or originally of Asian descent. And of course, it's not possible right now to do a full sociological analysis. But according to the people with whom we interacted yesterday from the Institute for Sustainable Communities, a lot of what, a lot of what is happening in the US right now is a combination of multiple interconnected issues that are perceived by black people to represent discrimination and hardship, of which COVID is the latest in a series of other aspects where that members of that community feel that they have less opportunity to access healthcare, less opportunity to be well nourished, less opportunity to get their kids into school, less opportunity to be in decent jobs, greater likelihood of being exposed to COVID and much greater difficulty with managing that COVID and its impact on their families. So today I've been reflecting with colleagues on just what this means for our collective response to COVID. It's not just tackling an infectious disease. It's not just re-equipping hospitals. It's not just trying to make certain that food supplies are available for poorer people. It's not just trying to provide social protection for poor people. It is looking at the structural features of society that are making it so, so crystal clear that people from Black, Asian, and other ethnicities in the United States are facing much greater risks as a result of this disease. I think the extra element that I want to be providing all the time is to say, don't just look at COVID in one national context. Look at it globally and just recognize that the people who are suffering as a result of this disease in India are people living in very dense housing, very poor conditions in New Delhi, in Ahmedabad, in Bombay, Mumbai, in Kolkata, in Chennai. And as India struggles to try to get on top of the COVID, it's actually finding that the place where the virus is spreading the most is the place where people live in some of the most deprived and difficult and unpleasant places. And so, yeah, COVID is a class issue. COVID is a justice issue. 
and it's a justice and class issue globally, not just in one or two settings. I thought I'd just give you a few reflections on this. And as I talk today, I'm going to take you on a journey which identifies some of the really massive challenges and the inequities and the injustices around COVID. But I want to show you that actually this will be a transformative force for humanity. And it's already happening. And that we will see a whole variety of new possibilities starting to emerge. As I finish these opening remarks in about 10 minutes, I'm going to encourage you, if you wish, to reflect on what you're seeing happening that represents some of the early shoots of the new reality that's emerging and the new patterns of leadership that are starting to appear. Because they won't come in any way that's necessarily super familiar to us. It won't be particular bosses or particular organizations or even particular kinds of people who will be at the front of the new leadership for the world that needs to emerge from where we are right now. But I believe the green shoots, the early signs are there. And so amidst the pain and the burning and the anger and the dying, there are some very positive things starting to emerge. And it's challenging sometimes to cope with the fact that there is simultaneously both unpleasantness and sadness on the one hand, and at the same time, something new that's coming up that really will be leading to a different future for us all. I thought I'd start with just a few things going through my usual sequence, but just updating on a couple of points that have come out in the last few days that I'm sure you've heard about. Number one, has the virus changed? No. Just straightforward, no. The virus is still just as dangerous, just as damaging, just as difficult as it ever was. And despite the fact that there are a couple of people in Italy who say the virus has weakened, I can tell you that in Latin America, in parts of Africa, in parts of India, this is still a difficult virus. And what I've told you before about long-term consequences of illness for middle-aged people who recover, that's coming out more and more with loads of new studies reminding us that this is not a trivial illness from which you get better quickly for quite a lot of people. I mentioned to you about the simple, the vital steps that have to be taken for a country or a community to get on top of this. And that the need to be able to defend against the virus by holding it at bay through quick identification of people who've got the disease and then through isolating them and then quick identification of their contacts and putting them in quarantine or isolating them as well. That this is the absolute cornerstone of the vital steps and that you've got to do it really quickly, but super humanely in order to get on top of it. And at the same time, people everywhere do need to understand what is known about the virus and its, and its transmission, which means physical distancing, which may well mean face protection, which means really good attention to hygiene. So during the last few days, there's been a new and amazingly useful meta-analysis of the different approaches for reducing transmission. And it says very clearly, yeah, you reduce risk quite a lot by maintaining a one meter physical distance. 
but you reduce risk much, much more to possibly 98, 99% risk reduction if you maintain a two meter physical distance. And of course, in every industry and in every government office, people are debating, should it be one meter, one and a half meters, two meters? And I keep saying, well, it's a question of risk. And so if you stick with one meter, there will be a number of people who still get infected with the one meter physical distance. And it's no good simply saying there's an absolute right or wrong thing to do. You have to continue in a job like mine to present people with what we know about the risk and then let them Either whether it's a government or a business or a local organization, they have to make their choices because there's no hard and fast yes or no. So here it is. One meter, significant reduction of risk of transmission. One and a half meters, a lot more. Two meters, nearly 100% reduction of risk. What's the outlier? It's if you're in a choir practice or a place where there's a big band playing lots of wind instruments and people are doing huge exhalation with enormous force. And then it seems that secretions can be aerosolized and travel a lot further. So be careful at choir practices, be careful at band practices. And all the time, what's also clear is that transmission is more likely to occur in confined spaces. But if there's ventilation, it's a lot better. If you're out in the open, transmission is super less likely. So we're getting more information on what the risks are, which are key for sense making about how we're going to live with this virus and adapt our behaviours. And talking today to airline industry representatives or last week to people in fast food uh, franchises and so on, you can start sharing with them what it feels like so that sense making becomes easier because that in the end is what we're all going to have to do. As people, we're not going to be instructed by our governments what we've got to do. We will be needing to make sense so that we can take the vital steps to reduce risk, supported by well-functioning public health services. And then what happens? Well, you actually get the situation under much better control. I was talking to Japanese today who were explaining to me how it has been possible in their country, despite the fact that they've had new uh, spikes coming back of disease, they are still holding them back. It's like constantly keeping that virus away through really well organized and well functioning social interactions, taking really seriously the guidance and internalizing. So Japan is showing very good signs. And there's a prospect now of a very interesting travel bubble involving Japan, New Zealand, Australia, Thailand, and Vietnam. Why? Because all these countries have managed to get ways in place to defend their communities against the virus. They've got organized, they've got the people involved, they've got the public health services working, and they're managing to get on with life and not have these terrible sterile discussions about whether it's the economy or public health. And then I think we're going to get another bubble in Europe coming up quite soon. Germany, Austria, Denmark, certainly Czech Republic looks like, probably Greece, perhaps some of the other, some of the Balkan countries. Looks like they're also going to have a, a way of interacting with each other that reflects a common approach, a confident approach, and a successful approach to getting on top of the virus. And I think that this will be the pattern of the future. Contiguous areas within countries or contiguous groups of countries who've got a pretty similar approach to dealing with the situation and who trust each other developing travel bubbles. I thought that you might like to, to know that there is quite a tough examination going on in Sweden about their outlier approach, which tried to put a high priority 
on public awareness and public behavior change. But it does seem as though they've had issues with also putting in place some of the new protocols for high-risk communities. And this is a real issue throughout Europe. New protocols for working in residential care for older people. New protocols for meat processing and fish processing plants. New protocols for public transport, particularly buses, uh, where staff are, are especially exposed. Protocols also for overcrowded passenger conveyance, like particularly uh, underground trains. Protocols for prisons and other often very densely crowded places where people are gathered together. And it seems that in Sweden, the big question that's being asked in the inquiry that's being posed is, has the government, as well as trying to move towards the population taking responsibility, has the government made one possible error? And that is creeping into reports of the Swedish strategy is this notion of herd immunity, of basically saying we will let this virus spread until there's enough people immune in the country that we won't need to worry anymore. I don't think any country actually considers that for now that is a feasible default strategy. Because even if there's only a 1% mortality rate, if you're infecting a country with 50 million people, that's an awful lot of folk who are going to die. And so I think that that whole question of whether herd immunity is a regional approach, reasonable approach, although it's discussed perhaps by some when trying to think through alternatives, is felt by many to be unethical. And part of the Swedish inquiry will question whether or not the herd immunity side has been overdone. So the virus is moving particularly dangerously in Brazil, in parts of Chile, in Peru, in Mexico. There are worries about what's going to happen in Haiti. It's in parts of Argentina, Colombia and Bolivia. But it's generally now building up in Latin America as a disease of poor people and a real, real stress for the economies of Latin American countries. I must say that that's where my big headache is, is what do you do in densely populated, poor urban communities where isolation is so difficult? Is the virus just gonna stay there and go on burning away? So India, relaxing lockdown restrictions in much of the country now, and goodness, but still maintaining a very tight restriction on human movement in some of the big slum areas, particularly in Mumbai. But then interestingly, Singapore this week saying, we've realized that as long as we have foreign worker dormitories that are overcrowded in our country, and I've told you that nearly a million people live in foreign work dormitories in Singapore, I see that the government has reached a conclusion that it has to invest in improving the quality of accommodation for foreign workers. So they're not so densely packed together as part of the strategy to reduce susceptibility to COVID. And I think we're gonna see the same in residential care for older people in more and more countries to the point where in some cases, that will mean certain buildings for older people care in a country like UK, which uses a lot of quite old buildings that have been converted for older people accommodation. They will just be declared inappropriate. I mean, the economic cost will be substantial. But that's going to be one of the big choices as we look at residential care, as we look at how people live. It's going to be actually local authorities, national governments, businesses and others saying we are going to have to change our standards for how people live and work. And we're going to have to improve the conditions for the workers in these places so that they don't become basically 
COVID centres where the virus just gets in and is hard to remove and causes a lot of suffering and death. So I'm watching it happening. I'm watching meat companies saying, we are going to change. Not many of them, but the first ones are saying so. I'm listening to people working in the residential care sector saying, we are going to adopt new standards, whether it's in Spain or in Ireland or in Scotland. And now I've told you, I've heard about the Singapore government saying, we are going to look after our foreign workers differently. Will that lead to a wave in the changes in which foreign workers are looked after in much of the Middle East? Will it will lead to a wave of change in the conditions for migrant workers who are moving across Europe to pick up vegetables and so on from the fields? I don't know, but I think it will. I really do think it will. I mean, what's the alternative? That you do what one famous world leader is doing right now, you're saying, we're not gonna tolerate the anger. We're not gonna tolerate the discord. We're not gonna fight for improvements. We're not gonna seek to change the structures that have repressed people and kept them, in some cases, in really unsatisfactory situations. We're not gonna do that, but instead, we're going to make certain that there is law and order. We're going to confront and we're going to use whatever force we need to hold this obey. Is that the approach that will be the dominant approach as we come through COVID? I don't think so. I don't think the leaders of this world, whether they're in business or whether they're in local authorities or national governments, on the whole, they're not going to go down that route. They're not going to suddenly close off slums because they've got a lot of COVID and pretend they don't exist. Shut the door and throw away the key. No. We're already seeing signs that COVID is leading to the beginnings of shifts, tiny, tiny steps in some of the structures that are associated with poverty and powerlessness. And that instead of simply turning their back on the issue and saying, well, that's too bad, they're poor, they'll just have to cope with this extra threat in their lives. World leaders everywhere are saying, no, we've got to do something about the conditions that lead to COVID being transmitted in particular occupations, in particular settlements. The shift is happening. The change is happening. It's now present tense. And so, yes, we see in, for me, one of the most extreme examples of the kind of leadership that says, tough, I don't care. We're just going to maintain law and order. We're going to bring out the soldiers. We're going to confine, contain, restrict. And that's that. Yeah, we've got that example in one country. But these are the same people who are being really badly affected by COVID. They're the same people who are conscious of what's happening to them. And they've got so many advocates in their own country and in the rest of the world. And there's no way that that kind of tyrannical approach to suffering can be applied to COVID in our world. In fact, it's the reverse. The principles of public health that put all people at the center, whatever their ethnicity, whatever their nationality, whatever their wealth, whatever their power, of course, whatever their skin color, those are the principles that will be applied in moving through to the COVID ready state. And those are some of the green shoots that we're starting to see. And that during these briefings, we're gonna talk about them more and more and more. Quite simply, because green shoots and new ideas, innovations that not only as showing the power of the human spirit, but also show the potential for change. They don't always come out 
in the newspaper headlines, in the newspapers we tend to read. You have to really scan through so many different sources, but we are hearing about them from the people who are in the midst of doing this work throughout the United States, throughout Latin America, throughout Africa, throughout the Middle East, throughout Europe, throughout South Asia, throughout East Asia, throughout Oceania. The changes are happening now. The new leadership is emerging now. The new approaches to life that bring together different disciplines and sectors are happening now. The focus on collective working across disciplines and among stakeholders is happening now. And the way that will be taken forward will not be using the same structures that we've had up till now. They will be changed. I can't tell you how they will be changed because it will be the new leaders, some of the ones who are leading the successful country approaches that I referred to just now. They'll be the leaders of the future. They'll be the trusted ones. They will work out what kind of structures and organizations they want. They won't necessarily say, we've got to use the UN or we've got to use the particular Chamber of Commerce or whatever. They will use their own organizing principles because they mustn't be restrained by the mechanisms we've had up till now that have created the space for tyranny, oppression, injustice of the kind that we've had to live with for so many decades. So those are just some remarks bridging together what I'm seeing happening in the United States and hearing about it with what we're seeing happening with COVID around the world, some of the new statistics that we've covered today and um, trying to present to you that although some of the news is quite grim and disturbing, there are so many signs of new and inspiring things starting to emerge. At least that's how I see it. Today, we do have people connected from the United States and Canada. We have people connected from France, Switzerland, Norway, Luxembourg, Netherlands, and the United Kingdom, but particularly picking out Scotland, as well as England. And then we have people connected from Tunisia, Egypt, and Nepal. So thank you all for joining. And thank you particularly to those of you who come regularly. One of the things that we hope we do is that by talking with you regularly and listening to you regularly, we're also offering you an opportunity to take your ideas forward. And we hope you will reflect and tell us what you feeling as a result of what we're saying. So the conversation stays going. And if you want to speak do just let us know in the chat and we'll see if it works. So with us today, I'd like to give special shout out to Florence. I hope she will switch on the camera um, uh, because here we are in, in the office and making and uh, operating it differently and very pleased to see you all. And then to John Atkinson, Catherine Deland, Julian Delimontex, Twi Nguyen, Magali Madi, who's not here because she's joining another thing uh, and that I will join later, and she's kindly telling me what's going on. Saber Moumen may not be here. He was, yeah, he's here. Saber, please wave. And Joe Colombano, who's not here, but I worked with Joe yesterday. So very glad you're all here. Right, so some of your comments, because um, very much I think you wanted to reflect on what I've talked about. So I'm just using the, I'm scanning my screen to see if Annie McLeod is there. Annie, 
If you feel like switching on your video and turning off your sound, I'll bring you in. Otherwise, I'll write what you said. So, Annie, do you want to give us what you just said? See if you can, yeah, you're on. Hi, um, my other half works with public health in, um, in Midlothian, which is the bit of Scotland where Edinburgh sits. And um, one thing we found out is that the already very dedicated frontline services are making giant efforts to go out and find homeless people and drug dependent people to take them stuff right to where they are to help them in a way that they always knew they could do but never felt they had permission to do before and now they feel they have permission so they're doing it and that's absolutely fabulous oh and thank you so much because i was just reading some of the reports that come through from the countries of the united kingdom saying that really homeless people have had more than their fair share of covid and covid related death so that's brilliant to read this, Annie. Thank you very much indeed. As you say, it's a tiny shoot. But isn't it great that people are now doing things without waiting for permission? Which is, of course, what we're all going to need to do in this emerging reality that we're part of now. If you wait for permission, you'll never get it. So you just do it. It's great. And then you can share with others and inspire them. Thank you, Annie. So Chris Langdon, I think you're there, but I can't see you in the image. Ah, oh, yes, I can. Your head was down. Chris, if you feel like undoing your mute button, uh, that would be quite nice, just to, because I'd like you to, to talk a little bit about Yemen, which was your subject. Chris, you have the floor. Thank you, David. And obviously what you said about uh, inequality and the United States is really important, but I thought it was worth raising, given you've said so many times about issues of fragile countries that have very difficult situations. We have a very difficult situation in Yemen with the very highest mortality rate from COVID. The statistics aren't realistic. The UN agencies are calling for massive increase in aid. There has been a pledging conference. I think it's still going on. So I think it would be very useful to get your assessment of the situation in, in Yemen, which is looking going from bad to worse. Well, just I agree with you, Chris. I mean, the, we've not been without warning on this from Mr. Guterres, from uh, Mark Lowcock, who is the head of humanitarian action in the UN, as well as from all the agencies. A friend of ours, Julian Harnais, has been working in Yemen. I went to see him in Sana a couple of years ago, and I just totally get this. This is a country where the health sector is completely demolished and people have very limited reserves and the virus is there and the suggestions are that fatality rates associated with the disease are much higher than anywhere else in the world and, and the world has a choice do you just kind of ignore this and just accept that there's going to be somewhere between 15 and 25 percent of the people who get the virus just dying partly because they're physically weak from food shortage and partly because there are just very limited health services because the war is just making it so hard to get supplies in and the UN needs so much extra security protection because it's so dangerous. Or do we actually say we must respond to the needs of the people of Yemen? This defines who we are as human beings. I'm hopeful that this will be a positive pledging conference. I'm hopeful that the two sides in the, in, who are primarily driving the war will just listen at least once to the serious request for ceasefire. I know that they're in very tight ratchet of hatred and that stopping the fighting is just so hard. But I agree with you, Chris. We have to keep Yemen high, high up on our priority list. The WHO are taking Yemen so seriously. They've made it a special area of attention. I was talking to the team responsible for this part of the world just last Friday. Friday, was it Catherine? Yeah. 
And um, really, it needs to be, be taken seriously. Uh, I, if anybody else on this call has any additional information about what can be done in Yemen and in other places where there is just extreme humanitarian need, very limited capacity, just some examples, Rohingya refugees in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh, refugees and displaced people in Somalia, refugees and displaced people in South Sudan, refugees and displaced people all over Syria, and then people who are in various forms of facility in Libya, as well as in Turkey. All these people are a huge threat, but I think Yemen is the ultimate difficult place. Chris, thank you very much indeed. And we'll follow up. We'll make this point of coming back to Yemen time and time again and seeing whether or not we can use our influence to make a difference there. Thank you. Thanks, David. And Kathy Matthews, would you like to unmute and tell us a bit, what was your impression? And then I'll give my answer. Just tell us where you are, Kathy. Thank you, Dr. DeBarra, from Toronto, Canada. And, uh, How do you do? These, these weekly seminars have been incredibly grounding and sustaining for me, so I can't thank you enough. Okay. Um, I, I'm surprised, and I wonder if you are, that my impression is that the second wave that we expected to see uh, from the states that opened up early, such as Georgia, doesn't seem to be here happening, and the doctors seem to be cautiously optimistic. I'm really surprised by that. Are you? Well, I'm, I'm hopeful that for some reason, the number of people who are bumping into each other, who've got, uh, when, when the virus is around, is sufficiently reduced, that there is very little driving for rapid transmission of the virus. And so the kind of explosive outbreaks that we saw in New York uh, and in New Orleans and a bit in some parts of Massachusetts and uh, in Seattle are not going to happen. But I'm also um, a bit nervous about this virus, and I think we have to wait another four to six weeks before we can draw any conclusion. I mean, my judgment for a virus, to, uh, for an outbreak to become explosive is about six weeks from the early cases through to the big numbers. So let's just keep a watch. But wouldn't it be wonderful if it turns out that for some reason there aren't these big spikes? This is where my big hope is. I'd much rather that predictions are found to be wrong rather than, and, and people are not so sick, rather than uh, the situation is bad. So like you, I'm watching and hoping. I'm not watching and waiting, waiting. And let's see. And by the way, big shout out to the government and people of Canada. Um, I know it hasn't been easy and there's not total harmonization across the different provincial authorities. I know that residential care for old people has been particularly challenging. And I know that some indigenous communities are really still nervous that they're gonna be hit with the double whammy really of the disease and also their basic facilities not being maintained because everybody's so busy on other things. But real, real um, courage and strength to you in your country uh, and to my hero, Dr. Teresa Tan, <laughs> who uh, is in public health agency. Thank you. I just think that members of my own family are here. And if they are, I just want to say, I hope you're here, but I'm looking, 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 and I, I can't see. Okay, so I'm told that uh, Polly, Lucas, and Tom are on. And if you are brilliant, if for any reason you've dropped off, then we'll make sure you know. I'd like to give a big shout out to Vicky Doyle. I hadn't noticed you were on until I started looking. Oh, there you are, Polly. Thank you very much indeed. That's great. You're somewhere in the sun. Lovely to see you. 
and I hope everybody else is well. I know where you are. Thank you very much indeed. Brilliant. Now, there we are. There's one of the grandchildren. Very good. To Annie McLeod. Annie, uh, let me um, just, um, just checking. Yeah. Where okay. are you? There you are, Annie. So we talked just now on your last comment. Would you like to just say, you very quickly with this, but would you like to answer it rather than just pose the question? And I'll tell you whether I agree with you. About social distancing and how long we'll About have herd immunity. Well, herd yeah. immunity. You started saying if herd immunity is not an option, so I'll just prompt you. Yeah. And if, we don't ha and if we don't have a vaccine, how long do we have to keep doing social distancing? I think my concern, because I, I normally work with cows, it's a bit easier than people, and we quite oh. often have a test, um, so we know how many of them were sick. Problem we seem to have at the moment is that we actually don't know how many people have been sick. So if we stop social distancing, we could end up with 70% of the world suddenly getting COVID. Yeah. And I cannot figure out how long we're going to have to keep going with the things we're doing right now. Or whether the, and I'm sure that some of the people you talk to must be thinking about this all the time, David. So if there's anything you can share with us, I'd love to hear it. Well, first of all, we all have to become good on risk. Uh, and as we do with other things, remember that just about every decision we take in life involves some degree of risk. And some of us, make a habit of being a bit riskier than others. Uh, but um, in general, that's how humans work, is they have to try to work out for themselves their idea of risk. It's just that because this is all so new, nobody's sure what the different sides of the equation are. But yeah, I think being in a position to maintain physical distance particularly in settings where we have to be close to people in an enclosed space for quite a long time, I think that's going to be the reality for the foreseeable future. I do think wearing face protection is going to happen and that we will get much better at knowing what a well-fitting face protector looks like and feels like and we'll advise each other. And I think we'll learn life with physical distancing, and try not to use social distancing until there's a vaccine that works, that's safe, and that's available to everybody. And some people will be deliberately risk-taking and will say, I don't care, and they will gather close together. I'm more worried about in karaoke bars than out on the moor or on the promenade or wherever because of the fact that Transmission is more in enclosed spaces. But I think physical distancing will happen. By the way, to Annie Feltham, as a result of much of what you've said, I'm not anticipating that older people are going to be either wanting to stay isolated for the foreseeable future or are going to be expected to do so. I think we too, in my particular age bracket, will be expecting to work through our risk and we'll be doing it and that's going to be part of life it just it's going to be a bumpy period I, I think what's become really tricky in in the British scene is this notion that the rules are set by the state I was reading it today in the times that question and answers what are the rules for who you can see and how you can do it and I thought okay for a bit, that's okay. But there has to be a very deliberate and systematic process of at least offering people the chance to take responsibility for themselves. And I know that there will be constant debates where people will say, but the state is not helping us to do this. There's not enough testing. There aren't the right people to keep us safe in the places where we're really at risk. So I can see that there's going to be quite a lot of difficulty about this. But again, watching the communication style of the Prime Minister, I think it was of St. Martin in the, in the Caribbean, the Prime Minister of New Zealand, or uh, I think it's the President of Taiwan, 
or the um, Chancellor of Germany, I'm seeing a real willingness on the part of these leaders to say, well, yeah, the state has a role. The state offers you parameters, but in the end, you're going to have to make the choices, just as with HIV. There was no state um, kind of regulation on, I think, on safe sex. I mean, it was just something that, that people had to learn to do. And I think it'll be the same on COVID. But it may be I've got my politics wrong on that. We'll see how it goes. So Marianne, coming to you now, and I can see you on the screen. If you want to unmute, it'd be nice to hear your voice. Depends how easy it is or whether you want to. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, really well. We've got good <laughs> yeah. volume. Okay, and uh, that's... Uh, excuse me. Um, can I... I wanted to ask you about Africa. I've, just before I came on the, on, the, on the call, I was talking to somebody in, high up in Uganda. Um, and what they were talking about in particular uh, was they are there now, they have fewer than 500 cases. But what he was saying is that is not necessarily true. It's, it could be 1,000, it could be 1,500. And the issue there is um, tra uh, testing, tracking, and tracing. Um, and so that you know that is that is the the uh, obviously a concern there. My son lives in South Africa. There, the on, yesterday they the choice was to open the bottle stores or for certain children to go back to school. They opened the bottle stores, which have been closed for ten weeks. Uh, there are so few uh, possibilities uh, for people. There's also so much poverty. And you look at what uh, I would disagree with slightly with what you're, you're saying. When you're looking at uh, what the Secretary General's report says, it's going to take longer to get the, to achieve the SDGs. Yeah. Then you add in COVID-19. And Africa is, is, is a key. So that's why I wanted your, your, your views on it. Well, the, my main informant of what's happening in that continent is uh, the combination of John and Kenga Song of the African Centers for Disease Control and uh, Samba So, who used to be Minister of Health of Mali. And they're both saying, of course, the numbers from Africa are a massive underestimate. The virus will become endemic in Africa. It'll be really hard to hold it at bay, and it will become another threat in the series of endemic threats faced by Africa's people, of which, of course, Ebola and cholera are both examples. So it becomes another uh, really dangerous thing in the palette of, of threats, of health threats that people face. And so much of the action, therefore, is trying to help communities do their best to not only protect against the virus, but to handle outbreaks when they start and to handle them humanely and decently. And all this will not be really viable until we move beyond, depending on polymerase chain reactions for the testing. So there's a huge need for more um, simpler on the spot tests. Uh, contact tracing is still possible. We did it on Ebola. Actually, it worked quite well. And isolation was not totally impossible, though I think in townships it's going to be hard. But uh, my, my answer will be that, uh, particularly once we've got better testing, that African communities and nations will work through how they're going to deal with this and uh, we will need to do all we can to provide support. My one concern is that uh, I, I just hope that there will be some cash left in uh, development assistance budgets when all the money has been spent on propping up uh, domestic businesses and other such things because uh, certainly African nations need help to advance this kind of work. Uh, Samba says they need money for research. Uh, they need money for 
much better uh, build up of local public health services and they will need money to expand testing, tracking and tracing. It's not a good answer, but that is my view on it. Uh, Annie is saying, I'm going to rush through now because we've only got eight minutes. Annie, I'm going to look into your eyes while I talk. There we go. Uh, you can unmute your mic and come in after I've said what I've said if you think I've misrepresented it. Describe, because I, I can almost hear you saying this. Despite green shoots at the local level, at a national level, it is much gloomier given the systemic challenges. People still talk about going back to normal rather than going forward to a new reality. You can see why now Japan is doing better than us in England, how to move forward. But I'd, I mean, I'd like you now just to unmute and just say, if you were in my shoes, I get the odd chance to do media. I get the odd chance to talk to politicians, odd chance to, in, to, to engage with the people trying to set up local level working in the UK. What would be your one instruction to me? I, thank you. And I want to differentiate between Scotland and England. And I'm extremely gloomy at the moment. And I think what I would like you to do is to develop an appetite for change. Yeah. Um, uh, and if you could do that with the Westminster government, that would be particularly appreciated. Yeah. So that, um, and what we've come up, up against, and it's like hitting a brick wall, and it just reminds me, if we can't do it in England, how much harder it's going to be to do it in Yemen. Yeah. Um, and it's that the systemic inequalities and the lack of power divided through society is making our job much harder. Um, and so in the end, um, we need a ladder which push, which lifts up what we're doing locally to the national level. And I don't even know whether that's possible in my physical lifetime. Um, but if you, if, if you can have any impact at the national level, um, and then maybe we can work together because one of the advantages of, this, of these two weekly briefing online is that actually we've moved on from isn't this awful and you saying this is a bit somber today to actually yeah. looking at what we can do about it yeah. and I'm really listening hard to try and understand what we can do about it um, uh, but I think my next sentences would be a bit political so I won't okay. both right at the moment I'll well, stop we're, we're all political Annie I think in our different ways but I'm talking to my informants from the US, my informants from India, my informants in different humanitarian crises, my informants in Africa like Samba particularly, they're all saying don't count on leadership from the top yeah. to chart the way forward. Mm. It is about working with local communities, local leaders and seeing whether we can just use whatever resources we have to help them connect together. Let's hear from Iman Ahmed. Just a couple of words about Sudan. Iman, unmute and tell us your experiences, if you can. I'm watching to see whether you can unmute. Sometimes it's not easy. Yeah, Hi, David. Over to you. Hi. Hi, David and everyone. Thank you for this opportunity. I, I feel privileged to be able to, to continue to be um, attending these um, briefings. On Sudan, you know, we, we're facing lots of varied types of difficulties. Uh, one of them I would like to focus on is the uh, economic uh, sanctions by the United States. Although the US says it has lifted the sanctions and the reality is it has, but it maintains the Sudan on the so-called list of countries sponsoring terrorism. And that basically means we still cannot do any uh, financial transactions. Uh, the country cannot receive money from abroad, uh, from the diaspora. Uh, major international banks cannot do transactions with Sudan. And if they take that risk, they face lots of uh, penalties by the US. So it's basically unilateral. I was happy to, to see a call for uh, submissions for a study by the United Nations Special Rapporteur on Human Rights, I believe. 
and we have, as Sudanese doctors abroad, completed that uh, submission. It consists of 10 questions. So our, our main topic was the, the impact on the health response, both preparedness and response to COVID-19. It will be made public, and uh, I will be happy to share that uh, with yeah, you. Please, by... Iman, please stay connected. This is really important. There's Thank so you. much energy and capacity among the Sudanese people to do amazing things in my experience. Both thank the people. You so thank you, thank you. Let's go to Lucky. It's going, bye, thank you. Thank you, oh, sorry to rush it. Lucky, would you like to unmute and just tell us a bit about what it's like doing your work as an optometrist in uh, the COVID world in the part of Nigeria where you're working. Lucky, over to you. Welcome. Okay. Thank you so much, David. It's been very interesting in this session today. Um, COVID-19 is quite um, a very serious problem in Nigeria currently. We have far above 10,000 cases and the number is increasing every day. Um, my major concern has been about the impact of COVID-19 on other health-related issues. We are yeah. witnessing people dying more from other conditions like diabetes, right. hypertension, more than even the COVID-19. The health system is overwhelmed and um, people are not assessing these basic services. For eye health, there is quite a whole lot. Currently, there are about 285 million visually impaired people. And with the way it's going, it's going to get worse. Glaucoma patients are not coming for follow-up visits. People with diabetic retinopathy, hypertensive retinopathy, they're not coming for follow-up visits. Either they are locked down somewhere or they are not able to move, they can't access services. So in, 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 in the whole, we are going to have more cases of blindness. Yeah. And all of the gains that we have been recording in the post vision 2020 has almost been eroded in this season. So it's been very challenging. And I don't know what, what health organization would do to um, create a system that allows for other basic services to still run since COVID-19 is going to stay for a while. So I'd like to hear your thoughts around that subject. Well, I think this is a real, real challenge. We just have to make sure that uh, we do not end up with other health services being completely paralyzed because of COVID. It's all, I mean, I, I, why I like doing these briefings is that we're all having to make sense of it. We're having to think it through. And Lucky, because you are articulating this, you're putting it into my head and into the heads of other people here. And that will then enable us, as we are moving forward with our sense making, to be able to think, well, yeah, you can't stop everything else because of COVID. So your points are totally well taken. We'll continue to work with you on trying to find it. I'm gonna go, because we're late, I'm just gonna offer one minute to a number of different people who wanted to say things, uh, just to make certain we cover them. Uh, and um, uh, Tracy, I see you have to go. So I'm gonna read what Tracy wrote. It's in the chat. Uh, she just said, the downtown east side community in Vancouver has now received funding. So it's building on the things she said last time, for starting and maintaining neighborhood housings to help and teach street people and the homeless uh, to basically have better lives. There's a big concern for those who are addicted and getting their drugs on the street. You might remember that Tracy talked about this issue on a previous briefing, and it's great that this is moving forward. And we'll try to make sure that next time uh, she is able uh, to perhaps give us a couple of words about it. SB Summers, there you are, I can see you. Can you unmute? Uh, 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 I'm just reading what it says on your on your thing. If you can unmute, if you're hearing me, uh, you could say, yeah, here you go. Could you say your announcement, please? Thank you, doctor. Um, I, uh, we have a, a group called the Stakeholder Group on Aging in Africa, a platform we started two years ago, and I'm honored to be allowed to be part of it. We're, we did a survey in Africa on COVID and older persons, and we're going to talk about that on Friday morning. Um, at one o'clock Abuja time, uh, if anyone wants to join or anyone has any feedback from Africa, as Marianne did today, I'm happy to hear her. It's really important for us to get good information to older persons in particular. So thank, thank you. you. Where, where are you speaking from, 
Well, I live in upstate New York. Right. But, Very um, good. Now, can I just tell everybody, it's on the chat, SB Summers to everybody. What do your, what SB stand for? Susan, Susan B, Susan. like Susan B. Anthony. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Susan. Nice to hear from you. Uh, thank you. Karina Squire, are you still on? Uh, there you Hi, are. Yes, I am actually. Yeah. Hi. You go. Say what it was you were going to say. So I was just uh, wondering what you thought about, you know, uh, emergent conflicts between COVID and other health priorities. I know a lot of people working in Zambia around HIV initiatives of, of finding this, that people are already thinking that there's going to be a, a resource fight over the kinds of resources that they've struggled for years to, um, to find for the HIV epidemic there. They feel those are going to be diverted and so on. I think that's um, a very reasonable anxiety. It's something that Marianne, who I think was on the call earlier just now, is particularly concerned about for women's health, reproductive health, abortion care, and so on. I think there are some major issues about diversion of resources, and it's really very alarming and disturbing. And it was the point I think that Lucky was talking about. So thank you for making that uh, very important point. Uh, could we just, um, uh, Catherine Cunningham asked me to comment on that. Uh, just to say, Catherine, yeah. I think there is a risk that there will be diversion of resources uh, away to other things. Um, we're seeing that already, that development resources are being used for different aspects of COVID, and that will mean that money for other priorities may be tougher to get. I mean, that's the way it is. This is a zero-sum game, unfortunately. So I, I do think that the points being made by several are correct, and, and that's where we have to use our advocacy capacity to do it. To my colleague, Catherine Deland. Kath, this is going to be the last comment because we're closing a minute, but you uh, had a couple of points you wanted to raise. Would you like to come in now and make those points? Catherine Deland. Just have to unmute. It may be that you're away from your computer. So uh, I will, um, all right. Okay, so what Catherine was saying was, what do I think business processes will be like as there are spikes of COVID moving forward? Will businesses have to self-isolate or will they have to close temporarily if there's an outbreak among staff? Answer, that will happen. And so Kath then says, how to ensure that small businesses survive in this kind of environment? Answer, there will need to be special insurance or protection for businesses that are hit by movement restrictions or the need to actually close for a period because of COVID. We've already seen that with some businesses in the food sector that have faced that problem. And then last question, I heard a panel on the radio today where somebody said, how can the new UK test and trace policy work if the app isn't up and running? Catherine, I just called on you, but I think that... Um, no, I it just took me a moment to get my computer up. I'm sorry, it's having some trouble. Oh, I see. So you were asking, do you need an app for effective contact tracing in this modern era? What's your answer? So I don't think we do. I mean, I think when we worked together in West Africa on Ebola, I mean, we had butcher paper and Sharpie markers. It does not, yeah. it does not seem to me like what you need is technology. Not that technology couldn't be helpful. It seems to me like what you need is enough people adequately trained and an educated population who know to tell their people that they're in contact with. But I mean, I don't know, but I'm not, I'm, I'm, you know, eight years into this and you are 40 years into this. So I thought I would ask. <laughs> well, I think uh, most of the people who are doing the various different testing, tracking and isolation operations are using this quaint term, shoe leather epidemiology. Yeah. The stuff that means you have to walk around, 
get your foot in puddles all the time. I mean, you know that story. You're often wading through brackish creeks, a bit sort of, uh, you're having to sometimes cope with those hostile glares of people saying, what are you doing coming into our space? But you have to do that. But just trying to rely on technology, I don't think is gonna work. And although this sounds old fashioned, uh, our friends who are working with the apps in Singapore, in South Korea, in China, are saying it can't just be the app. The app can help, but it's person to person. So that's my answer. Uh, and um, I think any government that's trying to rely on an app for contact tracing is getting itself into deep trouble. Uh, it's not enough. Do uh, you agree with me, Kath, or do you think I'm missing the point? No, I actually think, uh, I, I, it, to be, and this is going to be a little bit inflammatory, and I don't mean to be like that, but uh, there's a lot of places where you can't use an app because there isn't appropriate technology. And to say that you can't do this without an app means that those places are, what, just destined to not be able to contact Trace effectively? Yeah. I think we have evidence that that's just not true. Yeah, I agree. Everybody, thank you very much for joining us. I hope you found it interesting. Our, our mission in these sessions is always to try to be topical. So if something's happening in the news, we, and if we think it has a relationship, we will make that relationship. Otherwise, we feel that we're not kind of being alive. Secondly, we will try all the time to offer you updates based on what we've seen in the, in the news or picked up from colleagues around the world. Um, We'll try to react to your often very challenging questions. And we know that sometimes there's no answer to these questions, but at least we hold them. We hold them between us. We hold them in our conversations with others. And then we try to work through them because that then informs us as we go about our work. And then most importantly, just to really stress it to you, uh, just my parting comments are that actually, the future is already among us. And it's a time to amplify and accelerate the new patterns for the future that will help us all to chart the way to the challenges that are here now and that lie ahead. So remember, the future is here. And it's for us. It's for us to amplify and accelerate the patterns. And with that, we all say goodbye. We thank you very much indeed. We have do it the same on Thursday at the earlier time if you want to join. Uh, and um, then back again this time next week. And to all who are here, a big warm thank you from all of us. Bye-bye.